Uh, this is the webinar of Bay Kai. We have a program every uh, second Tuesday of the month. Uh, they've been on Zoom for the last several months, uh, as many things are. Um, we um, <clears throat> are a volunteer organization and we are um, franchised under um, ACM uh, and we're loosely affiliated with the uh, Kai um, community. Um, the, uh, the best best conference, I think, in the, in the industry. Um, within Bay Kai, um, we are interested in people that want to be part of it. And uh, you can be a creator, a, a Bay Kai creator, that's the volunteer that helps make the place, uh, by sending an email to volunteers at baykai.org. You can be organizing stuff, you could be making stuff, or you could be sort of supporting the organization as Steve uh, and, and Nancy Steve Williams and Nancy were for me today uh, in, in getting the closed captioning working, which I actually had working an hour and a half ago, but you know how it goes when they do it the, for the first time for something that matters. And um, on the first Tuesday of every month, we have a steering committee. People are welcome to join that if they want to try to wrestle and wrangle our organization. Um, and it's usually a very small group. Um, we start by introducing ourselves. Um, and I guess I'd like to say, um, anybody that's a first timer, we always like to see how that goes. Anybody want to raise up their hand? And uh, we like to notice how many people's hands are up when they when that uh, when when we do that. So please raise your hand. Um, and also, I guess I'm interested in in um, uh, we can ask a lot of other questions, but um, I guess I'm just going to keep moving, which is. Um, uh, there's something called a bird of a feather. That's another part of our organization. And Edwin uh, Lee, um, who's the vice chair of Baykai, he will be um, starting a new, um, a new uh, bird of a feather um, about Baykai work life. And you can uh, send any interest in that to uh, vice chair at baykai.org. So those are, those are um, a couple of opportunities. And now I really want to, uh, without further ado, um, start the program, uh, which tonight is, I think, a very special one. Um, we have some exciting people here. Um, there's a man named Fred Lake, and you've heard about me talking about him a little bit last year when he died in a fire. Um, and um, he um, had, had deep interest in visual language and also in performing graphics. And um, so we're gonna do two kind of things tonight. We have, we have a group of people, <clears throat> that knew him very, very well. Um, Larry Leifer um, was his patron for probably 20 years, first at the VA Rehabilitation Rehab Rehabilitation R&D Lab, and then um, at Stanford Center for Design Research. Um, Larry Leifer has been a professor at uh, Stanford in the, and been part of creating the design uh, curriculum in the mechanical engineering department that is so famous and so valued. Um, for probably 45 years, I'd probably have to look up and find out. Maybe it's even more. Um, and and uh, I don't see him here this evening, but I expect him momentarily. And he was going to lead off the the, the session, um, talking about um, his experience with Larry Life with with <laughs> Fred Lakin. And um, Gail Curtis um, will go next. He's an office mate that was really in the next cubicle for probably a decade. And there's a bit of parallel play about performance that I think that you're gonna enjoy listening to Gail talk about um, his experience talking to uh, Fred and, and, and even maybe conjuring up uh, dreams together um, as, as they, as they ran, went their parallel paths. Um, Scott Kim um, and um, Warren Robinette and, um, and Fred Lakin had a, a group that some of the rest of us sometimes got to join called DISDIN. And um, Scott Kim is a visual language practitioner and theorist. He wrote a wonderful thesis at Stanford about visual language and, and understanding um, uh, um, what is in a computer but what you see. Um, and he'll be speaking about his work, I hope a little bit, but also about Fred Lakin, I hope by a little bit. Now, Warburn Rebinet, uh, a real groundbreaking uh, researcher that, that did a lot of stuff in visual, uh, in, in, in virtual reality even, but <clears throat> he started making visual languages and um, creating uh, inter interactive games very long ago and was a dear friend of, of Fred Lakin's and went to uh, visit him in, in, his, um, 
in his various incantations. Henry Lieberman, uh, my gosh, Henry Lieberman met, met Fred Lakin when they were both uh, working at uh, Xerox Park for Alan Kay. It's a, it's a fascinating story, uh, 1980, 1980 or something like that, very long ago. And, um, and they've been dear friends ever since. And Henry's been a very big supporter of uh, some of the, the writing that Fred's done and, and mentoring. Uh, I will also speak a little bit. I, I've always been interested since 1981 when I met him, uh, giving a talk about a, a kaleidoscopic um, art project, which um, made his kaleidoscope by criticism. Um, and and I met him, and and been and he and I talked about visual language, and really I felt a lot of inspiration to work in that area. And uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit of that at the end. So why don't we get started with, um, it looks like uh, we're gonna start with Gail Curtis if we don't have a, a Larry. Is that um, um, a reasonable thing to go for? Um, Gail, I'm gonna stop yes. sharing so you can start sharing and I'll come back in as I need to, okay? Okay, let's see, share screen. All right, so I need for you to enable participant screen sharing. Okay, uh, you have to be uh, upgraded to a panelist, not a, um, Nancy, do you have that going for Gail? I think we're already panelists. Um, no, no, I think we've done it already, Gail. You should okay, be able so to- try, try sharing your screen, Try Gail. sharing, I fixed it. Oh, there we go. Okay, Got great. It. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> And share. Right. Okay, wait a second. And play. Okay. Here we go. So I was sort of hoping that uh, Larry was going to give the a little the back backstory about why how Fred ended up to be the BA Rehab R and D Center. We were. Larry was uh, you know, a professor in the design division of mechanical engineering at that time when I knew him. I was a student in the graduate product design program and Fred was a student in the joint program, the similar program several years before, but he was on the MFA side. He got an MFA in, in product design and I got uh, the MS in product design. And the... Uh, so somehow both of us got hired into the uh, VA Rehab R&D Center and which uh, looked at, you know, applying technology to problems related to rehab engineering. There's, there was bio biomedical engineering, there was a study of, you know, how bones worked and robotics and visual aids and omnidirectional wheelchair, everything was going on there. Uh, this is Fred here with the little arrow over his head. And uh, this is one of our weekly me uh, meetings of the Human Machine Integration Group. And uh, so we all kind of like, uh, this is where we got together and shared what we were doing. Uh, Larry's over here and I'm over here on here, and Fred is here. So this was kind of our, this is the environment we worked in and it was, um, it was, as Larry, probably, probably most of you don't know Larry, but Larry was very kind of like, had a very broad general picture about how, where ideas and innovation came from. And he, he was, he loved to just put people together and places together and see what came out. And uh, so that's kind of where we were. And I don't know whether actually it was hit by design that he stuck us in this, the two of us in the same corner, but it worked out very well. I think so. Yeah. And uh, I was there, my job, you know, I had a gig, which was developing videos, exhibits, and, you know, stuff like that around the research projects. And I'm not sure what Fred was doing, but the two of us sort of kept our, kind of kept the same schedule, that is being single guys with you know, eccentric ideas that didn't fit anywhere. And so, you know, our, our, I was realizing our, we both had sort of a similar schedule of 11 to seven every day. So in Linda late in the evening, we would get together and talk about 
stuff. And is this still visible? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think this is just after the time. I, th I thought maybe Larry would be telling about, you know, the Center for Design Research and where that came. That was in 1984. 1986, you know, we're sort of talking, well, how can we have a, how could there be a center that was about the stuff that we liked? You know, like uh, ideal of interface design, human values, you know, people working together and the risks of how you do that. I mean, I don't know what this is about. This is all kind of like, I just found this PDF in my file someplace. So one thing is this is, this is like Fred's whiteboard. I mean, his, his computer, right? This is the way he worked on his computer. You know, he would put some text notes and then slide them around and draw some lines and like that. And what the main takeaway for me right now is that, you know, he was looking at the contrast between you know, the fame, wealth, and power that drive a lot of things that happen in organizations. And, you know, the notions of service, play, and teamwork, which are the things that turn out to be really important to the people that are doing this stuff. And, um, and also, I have to say that we were both probably pretty naive about the institutional politics around any of this stuff. But we love to kind of play around uh, with the ideas. And um, so one thing that stuck with me is, if, is where he says, if there's play available, people will come to play. So wind ahead a decade or so. And, you know, Fred lived in Palo Alto at this. And he, after being for a few years at the rehab R&D center, he went over to the uh, Center for Design Research. And then after a few there's, years there, he was gone and he had moved out, I think, to Davenport. And then he found his way down to Big Sur. So Palo Alto to Palo, Palo Colorado Canyon. So here he found a, uh, what we would say is a, you know, like a community of, um, you know, create colorful, creative people that, uh, you know, were kind of like on his wavelengths. And this is, none of these are his houses, but he got to the point where he was organizing. I mean, uh, Ted mentioned, you know, the biz din, right? So Fred had, when he was around here, you know, the vision, the dinner, uh, dinner meeting of the people doing visual language stuff. Here he organized a thing that he ca called biz camp. And this little location that you see here is you know, in this kind of narrow canyon going up the Big Sur mountains, there was like a little place where there was an open meadow where a, a projection screens could be set up and people could set up projectors and their gear and musicians could be there. And so once a, once a year toward the end of the summer, you know, he would uh, invite people to, uh, people who were doing this stuff and that, uh, you know, there'd be like performance, collaborative performance, jamming, working together. And uh, so one so one year he, in 2014, he invited me to come because I had doing some, been doing some stuff that was related to, I'll, I'll show you in a minute anyway, related to image in, in in uh, photo montage. And so I thought, well, that would be good. You know, you could put that together with some of these other images. Here's an example of one person. And if I forget your name, if you're out there, please get in touch. So this, this guy was doing, he had a, a visual instrument there that was like, uh, it sort of looked like a vibraphone, but he was playing with his hands. And behind him, there is, on the screen is a projection of this red, the red and green and blue. These are like little swirly dots. And it was somebody else's projector. And then there are these kind of golden streaks that are going on, which is I think was from, was from his. And uh, it was of course fascinating to watch. And there, I have a little clip here with this thing going live and you'll hear also hear 
the, uh, the, the live uh, music by some local uh, musicians who were at the party. Oh, can you hear that? No, we're not hearing it yet. Okay, let me go back to... Uh, we, in the yeah. interest of time, the music isn't as important as the visual. Right, you're right. So anyway, so that was uh, one of the pieces and, you know, it was sort of like on the fly, we would sort of make the plan for how the evening was gonna go. So where, where I'm coming from is I was, I was doing image in performance, but I was coming from photographic world and photo montage. And I had been doing some collaborative performance with live musicians who were doing extemporaneous performance uh, piano, percussion, and saxophone, and a, a group called Helica, and I was doing the screen. And this is, these are a couple of shots from the a, a show we did at New Performance Gallery in the city. And uh, so, you know, I was doing that, but it what didn't lend itself. I mean, it was sort of like, okay, totally analog, right? Totally analog, totally. Uh, manual control, nothing digital, nothing automated, or at least programmable. So uh, I've been working with this fellow, Mike McNabb, who I think many of you know, a computer music guy, and a software developer, of course. And uh, we had done several collaborative performance and he, and one day I go to visit him in the city where he's living, he says, you know, what if we, I've been doing uh, iPad apps lately. What if we did an iPad app that did what you used to do with three slide projectors. So I said, okay. And so we did this and over the space of a couple of years, we uh, came up with this app. So I'm not gonna do a, try to do a live demo here, but I'm gonna show you the 30 second uh, preview that goes uh, in, the, in the app store. It's live in the app store. So what happened was, what happened was, uh, he, you know, some some good stuff got done at the biz camp, but after the first set, you know, the the performance, we sort of decided, you know, this, you know, trying to make all these photos work with all this other stuff is not good, and so what I ended up doing was pulling this out, and Fred, Ted said, I oh, I should show this, so there there's a little app called Uzu, which does lots of great uh, interactive uh, computer graphic stuff. It's really designed to, for hands-on uh, swirly things, okay? So uh, I did that and then Fred sort of, uh, Fred and I after the thing says, well, you know, you probably, that probably doesn't, uh, you know, it's probably not going to work to try to do this again. So, so I I I had enough, and I mean it was it was a, a good finishing. But we uh, we decided that what what I was doing was kind of like a little out of line with what was needed for. When when was that, Gail? This was uh, in 2014. Yeah, okay. So then it turns out I think that may have been the last biz camp because in 2016 Fred's head her house burned down in 2018. He was in a, another house that burned down and he, and he died as a result. So uh, in Fred's memory, so I put together this little thing, which probably a few of you may recognize is coming from the Prisoner uh, TV show, but it, it's memorable because it's the Lotus. So what many of us remember about Fred is, you know, 
his independence and his lotus, which he enjoyed. Uh, drama. Drama, yeah. And the maxim that I take away from uh, my association with this and, and looking at this, if there's play available, people will come to play, which I think is kind of ties into some of the other things that we're gonna see tonight. So we have a question, a, Dale, and yeah. I think it's a question everybody's going to get a chance to answer, <laughs> namely, what do you mean by visual language? Uh, there'll be a lot of that. Yeah. I think that'll, <laughs> that, that's, uh, Nancy, that, that will come out very strongly, especially in the next, uh, the next speaker, um, Scott so, Kim. Ted, um, no, Ted, so let me ask, yeah, so why am I on this panel that's about visual language? Because I haven't shown any visual language, so I'm going to say, yeah. You know, photo montage, you know, has its own language of putting together. But what I was doing, you know, basically has more to do with filmmaking and cinema about how you put images together than the other things that the other speakers that are going to talk about, which is really more pertinent and very uh, uh, much more engaging. So that's what I would say. I wasn't doing any visual language. I was more actually, you know, my individual language was how does this look to me and how am I weaving things together? So Gail, I think, I think your stuff is very pertinent. Uh, I think it's a great talk you just gave. Thank you very much. <coughs> and the, name of, and the name of the app that's in the app store, is it Imagio? Imagio. Yeah. I-M-A-J-J-I-O, right? Yeah, I-M-A-J-J-I-O. It's on the website, imagio.com, and it's also in the app store, so. Perfect. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Scott Kim uh, to, to, take, uh, to take a stab at uh, his story, uh, and and I think he's going to have some things to say about uh, visual language. As a matter of fact, okay, thanks, t thanks, Ted. And maybe you can show your uh, there. Oh, that's great. Okay, so um, when I arrived at uh, Stanford in 1973 as an undergraduate, the two coolest things on on campus were, I believe, the AI lab up in the hills, it looked like this eccentric circular building uh, where uh, characters like John McCarthy lived. The pretty much the rule, it was, it was kind of like a computer commune. I mean, he, John was also the inventor of time sharing besides inventing the programming Lisp. And pretty much I, uh, I quickly figured out that if you just squatted there, you could, you could work there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you were, you know, and you uh, followed, the, followed their loose rules. And, you know, a good community member. So I absolutely did that. The other place was the mechanical engineering uh, program. Uh, Gail was in that program. Uh, that of uh, where people like David Kelly, uh, founder of IDEO, uh, hung out. Uh, here, the picture here is the Imaginarium. This is just how far into the 60s they were. There was a, there was a circular projector covering the entire inside. You went in there to uh, uh, tweak your imagination. So, uh, so these are the two poles that really sort of defined the work that Fred did. And uh, he was, the, it's computer tools on the one hand and visual thinking on the other. Person who asked about visual language is probably also wondering about what does what visual thinking mean? And the short answer, it's not very satisfying, is that it's thinking where pictures play a primary role rather than a supporting role. And the metaphor is there are books that are primarily texts that have illustrations. But if you're a visual thinker, you kind of, you, there are books that are primarily uh, visuals and the text plays a supporting role, role as captions. So that's a shorthand for, for it. Okay, so two of, I'm gonna talk about Fred, then I'm gonna dive into the, uh, as Ted said, the issue of what is a visual language. It's a very important idea that I want to pass on. I think it would be a shame to, not pass that idea on. So t Doug Engelbart was definitely one of his heroes. Uh, this is a picture from his famous demo from 1968. It's been called the mother of all demos. Uh, this is Bill English who, um, uh, the two of them co-invented the, the mouse, but that's a tiny bit of what he did. This demo in 1968 demonstrated teleconferencing, computer networking, a text editor, interactive computer graphics and do it. And the most impressive thing to me is it wasn't used for rendering something like precise uh, engineering drawings. It was part of a conversation. 
in which the two were casually interacting, manipulating things as they were speaking. Very impressive demo, Very, really visionary. He did get a standing ovation at the time. His other hero was David Sibbett. David is um, still practicing in San Francisco. He, he's one of the pioneers of visual facilitation. So if you've ever been in a corporate meeting and somebody's drawing big, that's David uh, doing his, his work, uh, drawing big, drawing on huge scrolls of paper, um, diagramming what everybody says, uh, that's, that's what David was up to. This is again, graphics that is not final product. It's, it's something you use to think with. Um, David liked to say that uh, a group of people is a disabled organism because we don't have, you know, in typical meetings, we keep on reinforcing what we just said because we're trying to get it on the table. Well, if you display what everybody's saying, suddenly you can stop fighting for territory and, and have a shared experience of you're all talking about the same thing. David uh, developed a vocabulary uh, is shown at the bottom of different types of diagrams that he used frequently. And that really inspired Fred. Now, Viz Din has been mentioned. So that was Fred Lakin, Warren Robinette, who's gonna be talking next and we'll tell you more about his work and myself. Uh, Fred was working on his, his uh, interactive system inspired both by, uh, by uh, John McCarthy's LISP, Doug Engelbart's um, conversational use of computer graphics and uh, David Sibbett's uh, sort of um, real-time information diagramming. Warren, uh, among other things, was created the first graphic adventure game called Adventure on the Atari 2600. I watched him do it, it was fascinating. He also created the first Easter egg and that uh, inspired the uh, novel Ready Player One, which was recently made into a movie. I hear the uh, sequel just came out, Ready Player Two. Adventure is famous for many things, but what I really found inspiring was that it, he built um, a simulation engine there with little sprites that had uh, independent behaviors that were outside of his control. He really built a system and then built a, a game on top of that system. He went on to be a founding, a founder, co-founder of the learning company, uh, which became the biggest educational um, game company in the world before it blew up. And, um, I was very interested in what he did for, uh, for education. He continued this idea of building systems where uh, the user can construct things. Myself, I was working on my dissertation at Stanford. I'm not gonna talk too much about it. It was called Viewpoint though, and I will, and um, you can go to my website and find, uh, I'm gonna post pointers to my dissertation and I made a nice, um, uh, video of it, I, I'll say briefly that my inspiration uh, was from visual languages. And it was because I was both a visual, like Fred, I was both, a, I had a very visual orientation and I was a computer scientist. My mentor was was Donald Knuth, who was at that time creating tech and Metafont. And uh, um, there was a group of us who were very into typeface design, Carol Twombly and, uh, 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 let's see, Dan, I forget his last name, uh, were uh, two of the founding type designers at Adobe and they were part of our group. But it struck me as odd that here were visual artists and they were being, at, Knuth is uh, famous for uh, being way into the arts, but Knuth is a very strongly symbolic thinker. It struck me as odd that we were, uh, I saw these beautiful user interfaces at, at uh, Xerox Park. They're uh, very graphic, but the, the last thing to get graphics was programming. Uh, it's still the last thing because, well, it's, programmers are experts and they're used to thinking, looking at uh, symbols and imagining what they can do. It's, I wanted a way of programming that was as, as visually apparent as um, a blueprint or a diagram of something. Anyway, um, I'm, so I'm going to talk about this one idea. Somebody asked, what's a visual language? Well, the key word is visual. What makes a language visual? Well, obviously you can see it, but uh, so my, the motivation, there are a lot of people who have tried to build visual programming languages. There are some in use. But the purpose of a visual programming, first of all, is to appeal to <laughs> people who naturally think visually. Um, 
The second is that it's useful in visual domains. It's very natural to use it like for filmmaking or design, or in the case of IDEO, ideation. Um, designers often, even when they're not designing something visual, often do a lot of sketching to get their ideas down. And finally, um, I just think that it's possible to build a better user interface for programming. I, I'm, you know, I've written plenty of programs in plenty of languages, but I always have this sinking feeling that I cannot understand what I, I cannot look at a program and grok it in the same sense as nearly as clearly as I would like. That's what drove me. Okay, so the conventional edition, uh, definition of a visual programming language is a programming language that lets users create programs by manipulating program elements graphically rather than specifying them textually. Um, and that's the definition most languages uh, graphic. So uh, two uh, canonical examples of languages people think of when you think of visual language is, oh, it's like uh, Scratch. You know, you plug blocks together. So that's for kids because they can't ha handle the abstraction and um, it's kind of c gets cornered as a, as a kid's language. The other is uh, data flow languages. So there's a data flow language on the right where you can see, you can plug things together and see, watch data. Uh, in some of them, you can actually watch the data flow from one place to another. Uh, systems design languages like for economies are, uh, do this uh, to very good effect. But you can also get real spaghetti code very quickly. So the data flow languages have a, a reputation as spaghetti. Um, I want to watch my time because I'm probably going on too long. But these systems are only visual on the surface. And here's the key idea. This is what I want to take you away, everybody to take away. The system the pro, uh, the, uh, that's running the program cannot see or manipulate its own visual graphical structure in those languages that I just showed you. It is a visual, it's visual for the programmer, but not for the program. Unlike, and for those who, of you who are immersed in Lisp, you know the power of Lisp. Lisp has, a, uh, can you write in, in lists, uh, you output in lists, and it's, it's internally, it can manip manipulate its own structure as Lisp. So I want the same thing for graphics, but in conventional language, uh, graphical languages, the graphics are only for the user, user's benefit. There's not for the computer. So I consider that a very limited visual language. So our definition of visual programming, certainly Fred and, Fred and I, and to some extent, Warren, is a system for programming in which both the user and the system, the important thing is they see the same thing. They perceive, parse, and manipulate the same graphical structures. There's not a difference between what it's thinking about and what it, what I'm thinking about. Well, of course there is a difference. I'm just closing the difference. Um, that's a, maybe a bit of, uh, so I just told this to Henry a couple of days ago. He, Henry's brilliant at, at summarizing ideas. He <laughs> says, oh, so the appearance matters no matter how you got there. That's right. <laughs> so this is true in a text editor. Think about it. Uh, why do we write with, by typing these strings of characters? Wouldn't it be better to edit grammar trees <laughs> That's essentially what those uh, visual programming languages do, because then you always have the grammar correct. Well, when you're editing, it's faster and more flexible to use a very, f what, what I would call flat representation of text as a string. So you can cut part of it and put it over there and not worry that it's maybe ungrammatical uh, some of the time. And it does not matter how the text got there. If there's a, a parenthesis next to a period, it means the same thing. No, there's no hidden structure. Um, well, actually computers are, are notorious for hidden structure. That's where you get modes and you say, oh, it looks like this, but there's hidden characters. Anyway, here's the key idea. If you're really, uh, if, you, if uh, graphics play a primary representation, then you need to be able to work, edit with a flat representation and then parse the graphics to get structure. This is backwards from how computer scientists generally think about uh, graphics. Uh, you know, the, uh, one of the um, classic mantras is model view controller. You have an abstract data structure that's a model of, of something on the screen, and then it is rendered onto the screen. That's sort of the direction that, uh, that 
that's the down arrow here. That's the direction that data tends to flow. Well, but it can also flow the other direction, to flow uphill. And that's essential for any visual language. It's what we do, of course, when we look out into the world and, and see things. We have recognition engines. Of course, recognizing uh, uh, pictures takes a lot of horsepower. And when in 1981, when I started my dissertation, and uh, you know, when um, Ted met um, Fred and so on, uh, computers were not very powerful at this. Um, one of my heroes at the AI lab was Hans Moravec, and he said, well, we're about 30 orders of magnitude off. Hans is such a big dreamer, he, he, that didn't stop him. He said, okay, let's assume 30 orders of magnitude and start from there. <laughs> we're well on the way to getting there now. So examples of, of flat structures and uh, of parsing, uh, the easy things are like parenthesis matching, um, Henry just reminded me that he introduced that into uh, text editors. Uh, and um, uh, in graphics, there's optical character recognition. That's relatively easy as a vision task go because it's, you're working with something that's highly structured. Harder is like language translation or in the case of something graphical, handwriting recognition, it's quite difficult. There's another possibility though for, for parsing graphics, which is design a language that is a compromise between what the computer and the human need. So Fortran was the first high level programming language along with COBOL. When Grace Hopper pushed it to the military, everybody said, well, no, no, you don't understand. Computers can't understand English. That's not the point. The point is to create something that's English-like uh, English enough to help humans, but precise enough for the computer. And the same thing is uh, true in like barcodes and QR codes. There, uh, humans can look at, well, they're not, barcodes are not designed, o um, OCR fonts are. But um, anyway, they are designed to be easy to parse by a computer. And as we live in an uh, increasingly media rich world, there are more and more things like that, where we build codes into our media. I'm not going to say a whole lot more about uh, visual languages. There's a lot more to say, but um, Fred basically, his primitive representation of, of that image you see on the far left is it's all vectors. And if you know, you can see structures like, oh, there's a box around some words there. Well, yeah, if it's flat, that's the structure, but you can parse that structure from the vectors. You can detect boxes. Um, I noticed that Apple's new iPad software does this sort of thing. Um, on the right, um, my system parsed structure from the pixels, and my 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 mantra there was, which I'm halfway towards writing there on the screen. This is a screen from my dissertation. Is what you see is what you get, and uh, what I'm going to write in on the right is what the is what the computer gets. So um, both the computer in my system, both the user and the computer were looking at the screen and both had access to the pixels. And that was the only link between the computer and the user. It, it did not receive any, any information directly from the keyboard or mouse. Um, there's one other flat representation that's really worth mentioning. This is the most, the most common uh, visual language and it, uh, it's not a, a language in the conventional sense, but the most common visual interactive system where both the computer and the human have the same representation is spreadsheets, because a spreadsheet cells are a flat representation. And it doesn't matter how the 200 got to that cell, that 200 being next to Joe is what counts. Uh, I'll, just a little bit more. So I have a call to arms. 1949, we got assembly language. That was a big improvement on machine language. 1958, we got Fortran. That's textual programming languages. Not only is, do you get machine independent code, but it's easier for humans to use. The next uh, uh, revolution, which I was you know, working on, but didn't get very far was hopefully made a contribution to these visual programming languages. I still believe it's a worthwhile thing to strive for, but it hasn't happened yet. And the goal is human comprehensible pro programs that are easier, still easier for humans to use. This matters a lot because we're building an entire world with neural nets uh, that are running computer, computer programs that we don't understand. And that's pretty, pretty, much, pretty scary, scary stuff. 
I'll end by saying, what am I doing now? Well, unfortunately, I thought I made some uh, progress with visual programming, but uh, it was kind of a dead end for me. If I wanted to be an academic and go into research, I, I would have continued, but uh, that's not what I, where I want to go. So I decided to apply some of that same energy to mathematics and mathematics education, which is a big passion for me. So I'll just mention that my vision now is to, I've been designing educational games for teaching mathematics. And my basic mantra is math needs a better user interface. It's not that we need to teach it better. It's that math itself is not configured so it's teachable. It's like Chinese is fundamental, the written Chinese is fundamentally harder to teach than English, right? Uh, and uh, the, the um, notation we use for mathematics is much worse than Chinese. So my mission is to make all of math into a game to make it easier to learn and, uh, and fun to play. And um, I've written some about that on my site, uh, Scott Kim, scottkim.com. Uh, any questions? You know, a lot of people have been suggesting uh, uh, things that they wanna know whether you would consider them good candidates for visual programming like Chalk Talk from Ken Perlin, for example, or Somebody else asked, oh, somebody asked about programs like Max and MSP that are, would you say they're visual to the core? Um, they're, it's, that's a node-based one. Somebody said Apple Xcode Interface Builder is pretty good visual programming system. And I heard, we heard about dynamicland.org. Right, dynamicland is, uh, yeah. Uh, so I know Brett Victor pretty well and uh, he was in, he and I have talked a lot about that. Yeah, he, he's going that route. Um, uh, Max, like the, uh, that's a graphic data flow language for, for um, like musical synthesis. I don't know if that's, uh, that's not very visual. I mean, it's, it, again, it's a program that can't see it. Visual language though. When I went over and saw dynamic line, he made a point of showing me that, yes, you can point the computer, the, the camera at, the program that's running the system itself and it can parse it, parse the image. So yes, he went there. Some of the others, I'm not, I'm, oh, I've heard of Ken Perlin's system, but I don't know it well enough. The acid test is always, can it, uh, can the computer see its own visual representation or is it only for the benefit of, of the uh, user? So um, at this point, Scott, this is very exciting. And I think, um, I hope people will interact with you a little more, maybe off, maybe in the in the chat or something. But I want to make sure we keep our time, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to um, another friend that was in the Visden uh, group with you, Scott. That is Warren Robinette. And uh, Warren, could you uh, uh, take the stage, please? And I'm going to put my uh, uh, URL to the slideshow in the chat, and it includes the references to the right everything. And Scott, can you stop uh, sharing, please? Yeah. Well, if you're only going to, yeah, you have to find the where your slides are. That's the tricky part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't have any slides. But... Oh, okay. okay. It can just be you. Let's do this. So it, it looks pretty empty there. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. And uh, you see, see my cursor and you see two icons up there in the corner? Yes. All right. So, um, uh, well, so I, I'm going to give you another take on VizDen. Fred and Scott and I would meet um, every month or two and, and talk about our own work and talk about each other's work. And one thing that made it uh, interesting and valuable was that we had different points of view on things. So my point of view is a little bit different than Scott's, as you'll see. Um, I was interested in what you could do with computer graphics. And I'm gonna show you two examples of some of the stuff I worked on back then just to give a flavor of sort of stuff we were talking about. And um, um, 
I wasn't so interested in, I, I think you could say that a core interest was visual programming languages. As Scott said, we, we still don't really have a good example of a visual language that works all that well now. I'm not sure whether I still believe in the potential of it or not, because we like have had an entire lifetime each to work on it and we don't, <laughs> does that mean it doesn't work? I don't know. I haven't entirely given up, but uh, maybe we need a new generation, some new ideas or something. But I'm gonna show you some of the old ideas from the eighties, from when we were meeting regularly out in the Bay Area. Uh, so the plan of my 15 minutes is I'm going to show you two short videos of some stuff from back then. And then I'm going to read from Fred's book, Live Graphics Nightly, because I think Fred came closest to achieving his vision and his dream in fiction. He, could, he described what he thought visual improvisation could be paired up with music, even though it never got implemented. The implementation was sort of a work in progress when, when he passed. So that's the plan. Let me fire up the two videos now. Uh, this first one. Okay. You all see this? Thank you. See some Big, visualization. Is good. Hmm? <laughs> Big yes, is good. we do. Yeah, okay, good. So this is about 1979. Yeah. The new Atari 2600 home video game console was a game machine, but Atari management wanted a basic interpreter for it, and I volunteered to make one. The problem was that the Atari 2600 had a lot of limitations. 11 short lines of text could be displayed. The input device was a 24 key mini keyboard. The largest program it could hold was 64 bytes due to the Atari 2600's tiny RAM memory. But I decided this was enough. I decided that the limitation tiny program size could be turned into an advantage, turning lemons into lemonade, since it would always be possible to see the whole program on the screen, and we could show what was happening inside of it. Seeing a loop repeatedly execute the same code? Seeing a stack bone shrink? Seeing variables change value? run the program and halt it at different speeds. You could stop it and step through it to see exactly what was happening in each of its steps. Program a crude version of one player pong. This was an early attempt at visualization of computation, using graphics to show how a program works internally. It was not considered a success at Atari, since it sold only 50,000 copies, whereas my game adventure sold 1.3 million copies. But I did meet a few kids who told me they had learned a program using a basic programming cartridge. My next learning game, Rocky's Boots, was much more successful. Still, basic programming did open up the hood and show you the moving parts inside of a computer program as it was running, which as far as I know, no one had ever done before. The programs may have been small, but a kid could use this Atari 2600 cartridge to learn the basics of programming. All right, so that was an example of a visual programming language. Let's see how I can make it look like. Okay. 
Um, does that give you all an idea of what a visual programming language is? Yeah. Well, that's one example of one. Very articulate, beautiful. Now, uh, to be honest with you, th this, it worked sort of, but this was a failed experiment because the user interface with the little 24 key keyboard was so hard to use that almost nobody could enter in a three line program. So um, <laughs> I had hopes that every kid in the United States was gonna get one of these cartridges and learn to program, but that's not what happened. But um, sometimes the failed experiments are useful because of you learn something that you remember when you fail sometimes. Um, now I'm gonna show you a second video. Um, this one is about Rocky's Boots, the, which is the flagship uh, product of the learning company. Yeah, let's see. 1982, what was it? Came out in 1982, yes. Y'all can see this, right? Rocky's Boots was a pioneering educational software product. Yes. In 1982, running on the Apple II computer and the then new IBM PC. It was the first product of the learning company. It was designed by me, Warren Robinette, with help from my co-founders, Ann McCormick, Gary Pearl, and Leslie Grimm. My original idea for the game in 1980 was to make a sequel to my Atari video game adventure which I had designed for the Atari 2600 video game console in 1978 and 79, which was wildly popular in 1980. Unlike most games which existed at that time, the game world of adventure was much larger than a single screen. And in fact, its game world contained 30 rooms, each one filling the screen. Adventure also introduced the idea of items, which were graphical objects, which could be picked up by the player carried around through the game world and used to do things in the game. The items in Adventure were a sword for killing dragons, keys to unlock doors, a bridge to cross maze walls, and a magnet for retrieving lost items. The gameplay idea for the sequel to Adventure was to make a game in which the player had to build machines to defeat the monsters. The parts from which the machines were going to be built it's going to be sensors, which could sense things in the game world. Actuators, which could perform actions in the game. And logic gates, such as and, or, and not gates, which I thought could be used as the glue to flexibly link sensors to actuators. The building would be done by plugging the parts together on screen similar to children's construction toys, such as Legos or Kinects or Tinker Toys. I implemented a prototype containing sensors, actuators, and logic gates. But unfortunately, I never got to make the sequel I wanted to make because our little company was running out of money. So I quickly made a simplified game containing logic puzzles. There were no monsters to defeat and it wasn't an adventure game but it did succeed as an educational product selling 100,000 copies, which let the company turn the corner and avoid bankruptcy. It also won Software of the Year awards in 1983 from the magazine's Parents' Choice and Learning magazine. As an educational game, Rocky's Boots was significant because it showed how video game techniques could be used in education. Techniques like animation, interactivity, and simulation. Complex processes could be simulated. Animated graphics could show how they worked. Interactivity allowed the student to experiment, solve problems, to get feedback about what worked and what did not work. It was obvious that video games were highly motivating to kids, but could that motivation be tapped and used for good purposes? Rocky's boots seemed to prove that the answer was yes. The Learning Company went on to become a major publisher of educational software in the 1980s and early 1990s, publishing hundreds of educational software titles. Unfortunately, after the mergers and acquisitions of the dot-com era, the Learning Company ceased to be a producer of new educational titles. 
a game such as Rocky's Boots live on in emulation. Okay. So one of the questions that came up was how how does this part relate to Fred? Yeah. Well, this is that's a good question. I I, I did wonder whether I should show this or not because it's kind of Warren centric. But I thought that showing some actual visual languages, since this is Kai, from the time when we, for Scott and Fred and I were meeting regularly, made some sense. Um, the second. What I'm going to do next does relate to Fred. It's reading from his book about his vision of visual graphicists performing. So it this relates to the context of uh, our little club, VizDen, and the kind of stuff we were talking about and doing. We're interested in uh, hearing the hearing your next part. Okay. All right. Um, so Fred wrote this book. Um, Live Graphics Nightly, it used to be available on Amazon, but it wasn't when I looked recently. Let me see this. If you, are you going to need to share the screen still? Because if not, you would show it bigger and... Well, no, I'm just going to read from it. That's so, okay. You can stop your sharing, that's all. Oh, stop my sharing, okay. Uh, how do I do that? There's a little thing. Okay, stop better. Yeah. New screen sharing, stop sharing. Thank you. Okay. So now I'll pop up if I'm speaking, right? Yep. So uh, here's the book. Um, Fred had a, he, he had a certain way of talking. I'm not sure if I can describe it, but that I'm going to be reading his own words. He, he just, uh, there was something about Fred that was very interesting. So, Kind of a drawl, kind of a slow. Yeah, he had kind of a drawl, but it was from Los Angeles. Why does somebody from Los Angeles have a drawl? Because he's <laughs> acting. Cowboy. <laughs> yeah, he was kind of a cowboy. That's true, too. I, I, I'm not sure I could describe him, but I'm going to let, I'm just going to read a few passages from the, and I guess I could need to describe his book. So Fred invented something he, I think he really wanted to make himself, but he was in his 60s, I guess, when he wrote this book. And uh, it's about, it's modeled on a, a um, jazz bar in Oakland called Eli's under the freeway. But Fred reinvented the jazz bar, the blues bar, as a graphics bar. Live, it's not live jazz nightly, it's live graphics nightly. And he renamed Eli, the founder of the bar, as V-Li. Okay. And so it's mostly about one night at VLIs when there are a half a dozen graphicists they're going to get up and perform okay and what they're going to do is throw beam because they had a big screen up there and they had some sort of manual control device and they had some software that they had bought or probably put together themselves and maybe built the manual input devices and I was kind of like a saxophonist getting up after a, uh, a guitarist and um, let me just read some of it. Performing live graphics for an audience is partly about immediate stage presence, about being both the guy making the amazing images and also being the guy people want to watch while he's making those amazing images. Effective on stage demeanors vary widely. Cool and hip is nice. Flashy can be great, but comfortable is almost mandatory. And Mo has never been comfortable on stage. Confidence in his input linkage will help Mo in this regard a whole lot. So I really hope the new driver works out for him. The payoff for comfort goes deeper. Stage presence is only part of performing. There's also the visual meat that must be delivered. Increase Mo's comfort in his live imaging, it live image making will look better too. The key is ramping up his own personal enjoyment of the graphics process, which is definitely lacking. To compound the problem, Mo stubbornly sticks to the worst possible style of performing graphics for someone with onstage malaise, pure visual improv in real time. 
See, when an artist swings that way, it's as if the graphics flow directly from his nervous system. So for Mo, what comes through is hard and cold, a retreat to street persona. He can only manage to relax a little. He may be able to really throw some beam for the folks and sling those pixels soft and sweet and easy like he does in our private biz jam sessions. Now that really painted a picture of a world that doesn't exist yet. I, I, at least I can see it and I, and I hope those of you who are listening can see it too, because I think he captured it pretty well. Let's see. So here's another one about another performer. On stage, Robert is dancing and jumping around. On screen, he's pixel drifting. The audience is totally into it and clapping along with Robert's imaging and the music, which sounds like another Mexican hip hop act. This time I recognize a track by Los Caballeros del Plan G. Pixel drifting is a visual invention of Martin's. When Robert does drifting, the action takes place within a smaller frame in the middle of the big screen. Inside the smaller frame, the thrashing frame, graffiti forms are being created and moved around and erased very rapidly. Only the forms are not so much being moved as being flung around very rhythmically and in such a way that they acquire a kind of visual mass. So with the mass and the speed and the rhythm, the forms seem to be skidding around inside the frame. In fact, they are skidding because when they turn a corner, we can see pixels skitter out of the frame. The graffiti forms are changing direction so fast they're losing traction and spraying pixels before they regain control and go off in a new direction. The pixel spray left behind is continuously falling slowly down to accumulate in ever larger drifts at the bottom of the big screen. And it's all happening, all the creating and flinging and drifting to a visual beat in sync with the melodic beat of Plan G. And the audience is clapping along with that collaborative beat, totally into it. I think it's a great picture of a world that doesn't, I don't think it exists yet, people trying to do it. So I've got one more. The, uh, the protagonist in this book, uh, his, he, uh, he goes by the name Amoeba Man, although his real name is Alan Morgan and everybody calls him AM. I, I think this character was Fred. Okay, so yep. Fred, or sorry, uh, Amoeba Man performed that night and, and this is about his performance. Then I go into an Emacs shell buffer and start my Amoeba herding software. The performance window up, comes up, it's blackness filling the screen. The window is dark because tonight I'll be working glowing forms against a black background. I pick up the stylus and slip it onto my right thumb. Then I use the left hand keys to quickly create a few amoebas. They look like little white islands with convoluted coastlines edged in foaming surf. As the amoeba island forms splash into existence screen center, I catch them with a thumb stylus, spin them clockwise a few turns, and then implode them with a small flourish. Everything seems to be working. Then I create one more amoeba island form, which I do not implode, instead letting it remain. I change the color of the island part itself from default white to transparent so that it disappears into the background, leaving visible on the screen only the surf line edge of the coast. And I now change the color of the surf line edge to pure RGB blue, its mid-level value subtly blending in with and yet clearly standing out against the black background just like a good baseline should. Next, I enlarge the surf line form until it gets too big to fit and its blue violet pseudopods begin to be clipped by the sides of the screen. I continue enlarging and finally there's left just a curving section of the surf line, the brightness gently pulsing as I throb it with my left thumb on the space bar. This is the opening visual I will use for Professor's first song in my playlist, Big Chief. Roughly centered left to right and running top to bottom, the surf line edge is located in its initial position according to my choreography for this piece. Choreography I painstakingly worked out during rehearsals over the last week. Finally, I lower the brightness of, of the blue violet edge shape down to nothing. Next time this engine, next time this image comes to light, 
will be on the big screen in front of the folks. Now, please make no mistake. I am Amoeba Man. Truth be known, it's been a long time since you saw a complete amoeba on the screen at one of my performances. Mostly what you see is now the edge, or what could be the edge of a giant flexing amoeba. An edge of swirling colors, usually not sharply delineated, but instead feathering in and out like a cold front, or like a dynamic simulation of wave action on the curving beaches of a small, irregularly shaped island, which is in fact what the application did before I hacked it. The original program was a nifty piece of open source from the US Coast Guard called WaveSim-1.4.2. Loved the images, hated the user interface. So I modified the UI severely and sincerely to serve my own twisted real-time visual needs. Then I renamed it the Moving Sea Performing Graphics System. Good old Moving Sea my sweet visual acts, my second body, my home away from the flesh. It took me many hours of hacking to totally rebuild a midshipman's interface. Turned out I should have junked it and started from scratch rather than rewriting it. Will I never learn? Anyway, the final product is a UI optimized for rapidly performing graphics. Towards this end, the first tier of e-controls falls ready to use exactly correct for my left hand leaving all the pointing, drawing, dragging for the right, Engelbart style. And it works real good. Oceanographics becomes Oceans of Graphics. EMC is exactly the right tool for the job if one is of a mind to create and control a dynamically waving edge of color improvised live in real time for an audience. And then perhaps to tastefully layer more on top of the same resulting in multiple edges for multiple overlapping undulating amoeba, or rather multiple edges of what could be multiple overlapping and undulating amoeba, but no one can tell because I'm way zoomed in and you can't see the complete outlines of the little one-celled buggers. So at least in spirit, I am still amoeba man, but in practice, undulating feathered edge man, hey, art evolves. Thank you. Warren, um, yeah, yeah. we're going to have to move on a little bit, but uh, what I wanted to mo point out is how uh, Gail's, Gail's uh, thing, uh, images that he was showing uh, were really striving in that same direction a little bit. And I really love how the imagery, uh, throwing, the, throwing the graphics uh, really does fit together in my mind with that story uh, and what Gail was doing. And then um, uh, some of us have seen some of the people at the Viz camp that have that have uh, tried to go in that direction as well. Um, is there any parting comment? I think we're just a little low on time. Is there anything you want to say? Um, not really. I think that's it's a beautiful uh, story, and thank you. I want to move on to Henry Lieberman, a colleague that uh, has the a live graphic nightly in the background. <laughs> uh, he's he's actually wearing a T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> about this uh, particular place that uh, Warren's talking about and uh, is, is, uh, was so engaged in this that he actually may have, may have done some of the tech, the editing on that book too. Okay, uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, my name is Henry. I'm the bartender here at Vlize. Um, uh, <laughs> just an unassuming little joint. You could see it uh, in on my left there. It's um, underneath the 580 freeway in Oakland. And um, uh, you, it's a graphics bar. Now you could think of it as kind of like a blues bar, but in this case, the blues are the pixels with the longest wavelength. Okay. And um, uh, we do have some blues musicians who stop by, particularly Fred's favorite, uh, Buddy Guy, every once in a while. And um, I've heard some people, you know, doubt whether uh, VLIs is really exists. And, but I just want to put that to rest. If the scene at VLIs, that visual performance, if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. <laughs> So, um, so welcome to VLIs. Uh, pull up a bar stool and uh, let me let me get my uh, screen ready for the performance here. Oops. 
Oh, I blew it. Hold on just a second. Because if I don't do it correctly, uh, you won't hear the sound. Let's try that again. Again. Okay, uh, you're going to have to tell me what you're seeing because I can't see you. Lots of windows. And we're uh, seeing okay. you about to select something there. Yeah, all right, that's not right. <laughs> How many screens do we have? All right, let's uh, take it from the top. Okay, and tell me what you're uh, seeing here. Nothing yet. You're seeing nothing. No, I, I'm just seeing that you've started black. screen sharing and it hasn't shown us. It's black. <clears throat> Damn. It says you're this trying to share. Yeah, this is why we need to have tested this. Um, Can you put your screen on that one that you had? Yeah, now go back up no to the top of that. Revolution. Huh? No dance, no revolution. No, yeah. Are you seeing the full screen or, or are you seeing the PowerPoint stuff? We're seeing I'm the seeing PowerPoint, PowerPoint stuff. stuff. You know how to get to full screen though, right? Uh, let me yeah, try. that one, that's the one. Hopefully. Give it a second. Okay, excellent. Okay, yeah. great, yeah. okay. Okay, all right, great. So uh, tonight's performance is called No Dance, No Revolution. And some of you may know the quote from uh, Emma Goldman, a uh, famous uh, socialist politi pol um, activist. And she said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. Okay. And what did she mean by that? Well, she meant that, you know, if you're trying to have a revolution because you want to make a better world, then you got to assure that in this better world, people are, are going to be able to express themselves by dancing or however it is. And the problem with the digital revolution, Fred thought, and I think this is true, is just it makes it hard for people to express themselves in a natural way, the way they would if they were at a dance party. Right. So uh, this is uh, visual. This is Fred's um, uh, visual uh, language for if if I can't dance implies I don't want to be part of your revolution. OK, so uh, that's uh, that was uh, Fred's ambition that that, you know, being part of the digital revolution would be as fun as being at a dance party, but it would also give you access to the full visual power of computing. And Scott likes to point out that, um, you know, we, we, it's easy to get graphic input in the eyes because we just look and then we see these complicated scenes, but humans don't really are not, they don't have wired for graphic output so easily. We can't output a graphical scene in the same way we can, we can input it with our eyes. So that was it. That, that was Fred's ambition. Um, so here's a little sketch of Fred. Uh, he was my favorite bar fly at um, v Lies Graphics Bar. And uh, I love this uh, cartoon of Fred. I don't, I don't know who did it, but um, it shows Fred drawing himself. And I think that's kind of uh, representative of his uh, meta attitude. So um, I first met Fred uh, when I was uh, invited by Alan Kay to spend a summer at Xerox Park. Um, uh, and um, uh, there was myself, Fred, and Dan Halbert. And Alan liked to collect people he thought had interesting ways of uh, interacting with computer. I was working on programming by example. And, um, uh, but we were a little bit anomalies at Park at that time because, you know, uh, there were, it was a very secretive place because they were working on the, what became the Macintosh and Windows. And people were always whispering in the hallways, who are these kids? Where do they come from? And the answer, and 
and the answer was always, oh, it's okay. They were generated by Alan. So that was our slogan. We were generated by Alan. Um, and uh, Fred, um, there were lots of, I think there were lots of different ways of being a scientist, I think. And as uh, a field, we kind of have an ecology of different kinds of people. And some people, um, you know, they flip from one idea to another. Some people follow the trends. So they're working on deep learning this week because that's what's popular and so forth. But Fred was the kind of scientist who um, uh, he did, he had one idea. And it was like a really, really, really great idea. And he worked on it for 50 years straight that I know of, okay? And I think science needs those kinds of people, you know? So Fred was an artist who had to invent his own art form because it didn't exist. Fred was a scientist who he, he didn't, he wasn't, um, trained as a computer scientist. Uh, he didn't have credentials. He did publish a few scientific papers, but the, his best scientific work was in two science fiction novels, Live Graphics Nightly that uh, Warren just read you stuff from and uh, another one called Sidecasters. Okay, so my job tonight is to tell you that one great idea that Fred had, and it's this. Code is graphics, graphics is code. That is it. And of course, Scott already uh, gave you a little preview of that idea. Um, so, uh, and it was an idea that Fred had and people mentioned Brett Victor and Ken Perlin and, and Ken Kahn and a lot of visual uh, languages that came after Fred. And I think those ones in particular were all very much influenced uh, by, by Fred. Um, so uh, Fred wasn't really an AI person, but he hung around with the AI lab at Stanford. He was good friends with John McCarthy and he hung around with us Lispers. And the thing that he really got fascinated on about Lisp was Lisp, the mantra in Lisp is data is code, code is data. It's the same structures that Lisp manipulates as data also represent its code. So code is graphics. So Fred thought, why can't graphics be part of code? So here you have stuff that you see in programming languages, progen, defun, set, right, scale, you know, and stuff. But also he wanted to put graphics in the program, especially if the program was drawing graphics, why couldn't you just draw graphics as part of the program? So he made it possible for graphics to act as code. And then the other thing he wanted to do was make code be, was, uh, rather code is graphics, graphics is code. So if you have some sort of graphics, why can't we attach semantic meaning? Why can't we attach procedural um, uh, events to things like drawings of saxophones and stuff? And that way we can animate our graphics using procedural ideas. We can make the code dance. So this is the dance part of the revolution. Okay. so. Uh, we talked about his, his book, Live Graphics Nightly. Um, and uh, in the book, I'll just, yeah, I won't read you too much. Maybe I'll read a little bit, but um, uh, here's a page from uh, um, uh, Live Graphics Nightly. And what he imagined was that in VLI's graphics bar, um, there would be performances by people uh, projecting graphics on the screen of the bar and then maybe having music and people dancing and part of the performance, okay. Um, uh, he, so he imagined and he brought together three different cultures in Live Graphics Nightly book. One is Silicon Valley do-it-yourself computer culture. You guys are probably most familiar with that. Another is hip hop culture. So he imagined that this art would be of live graphics projection would be taken up by, um, uh, by uh, low income people in neighborhoods like Oakland and Compton and the Bronx and would become like part of the hip hop culture, which he uh, referred to as hip hop. 
The night was warm and auspicious. His rig was hot and bodacious. FMG, uh, that was uh, Flashmaster Grande, who uh, was uh, an avatar for Grandmaster Flash in the Bronx, who was one of the pioneers of hip hop, proceeded to beam top-notch sweet lightning out through a secondhand projector that was sucking juice from somebody's car battery. Such was the birthing of hip hop. Okay, so he had those two cultures, and then he also combined it with uh, French um, existential philosophy. He wrote about uh, uh, the Académie de Graphique Improvisée in Versailles, France. And so he had these three different cultures who were all represented in the book as working in this dynamic uh, graphics art here. Okay. The closest th and uh, fr and also because uh, fry uh, um, fred was thinking about um uh graphics and the use of things like david civet's meeting facilitation he wasn't only thinking about performance in terms of entertainment he was thinking that anytime we go to a whiteboard and draw pictures on the whiteboard we are um uh, we are doing live graphics performing. If you're a teacher teaching a class, you're doing live graphics performing, okay? Um, and he wanted to make a visual language for all of this, okay? Maybe the closest thing that we have to the kind of um, performance that he was envisioning now is this, um, this movement called live coding or live programming. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but in nightclubs, uh, uh, you know, there are light shows. Um, and nowadays, of course, they're often run by, by programs. And there has been this subculture of, of uh, called live coding, which is you have the programmers who are running these um, uh, visualizations, and they put up on the screen, in addition to the flashing lights and the colors and the swirling patterns, they also put up the text of the program, and they manipulate that program in real time. And that was kind of what Fred envisioned, okay. But if you watch this live coding art, um, you see that the kinds of minute programming they do are actually kind of trivial, is all they do is usually, you know, they tweak a number in the program and then you see, you know, it changes the speed of the graphics or the color of the graphics or something. They're really making very trivial changes to a program that's mostly fixed in advance. Okay, so uh, I was on the program committee for a conference in live programming and I thought, um, I want to get Fred invited to do a performance at this um, at this thing because I thought it was a perfect audience for him. Okay, but Fred, as his friends will know, he was very shy about doing public performances, and he was not a little bit paranoid. He worried that his ideas would be stolen or something. Okay, so um, I had, you know, so normally if I just invited somebody for a performance at a conference, they would say yes, but I had to convince him for hours and hours and hours that he 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 should be doing this, and um, finally, and I, I wasn't making much headway, and finally I said to him, listen, Fred, why don't you just do a performance right now for me? And I'll record it on my phone. And we'll just use that as a story. I won't show it to anybody. Okay. But I'll just use it as a, um, uh, uh, you know, I'll use it to get the, the conference interested. And it'll be a storyboard for uh, this performance that you want to give. Okay. So he agreed to do this. Okay, uh, so I recorded this. I didn't even expect to look at it afterwards. The whole th purpose of it was just to get him to agree to do that rehearsal and think about performing at that conference. Okay, then, and I uh, visited him at his, what he called his shack, which was that beautiful cabin in the woods that Gail showed you, okay? Um, and so I recorded this video. I had a session with him. It was great. I recorded this video. And then he died, okay? His cabin burned up in one of the fires. He had mobility problems. He couldn't get out in time. So, uh, so this was the last demo he ever gave, okay, to my knowledge. And what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna show you uh, some of this. So um, he was working for, as I said, for 50 years on the same program. It was called, and his latest incarnation of it was called Viztopia. So Viztopia was his Stradivarius. And what you're seeing is gonna be the rehearsal for the unfinished symphony. 
Okay. Now I have to um, beg your pardon a little bit, okay? And I have to ask you to use your imagination because unlike the live coding thing and unlike uh, VizCamp, it's not gonna be beautiful graphics with beautiful colors, okay? In his, his system was just black and white line drawings, okay? And that was one of the problems he had is it wasn't very visually impressive, okay? But, um, uh, so I want you to imagine that it was controlling not just text and black and white graphics, but that we have, you know, beautiful swirling diagrams and, you know, 3D visuals and uh, fly throughs of galactic space and all the kinds of thing that you're, that, that you're interested in seeing about today's computer graphics. Okay. So with that said, now I'm going to show you just a few pieces of this. Okay. So the first thing is the, performance that he planned on doing was to show lyrics to the song to the song that um, uh, and then animate uh, manipulation of those lyrics in real time and we're just going to be seeing this in black and white and and it's to the tune of uh, call the doctor from uh, Slater Kinney and uh, so if we hear if we get some uh, sound Okay, so that's it. It wasn't very impressive, but um, you have to use your imagination a little bit. Um, if you hear the song, the Slater Kinney song, there's Slater and Kinney, and uh, you know one is saying "Call the doctor," and then the other is talking over it. It's very hard to hear in that. So there are essentially two interleaved lyrics, and what he's doing is you know separating them visually in real time as they come out. Okay, and uh, so that was kind of the plan for the performance. Okay, um, so you might look at this and you might say, okay, that's not very impressive as all he did was pick up some words and jiggle them on the screen. That's basically it. Okay, so uh, my challenge to you then is to try this at home. Okay, because I'll bet that even though as simple as this is, you can't do it. Okay, and why? Because if you have a graphical editor, sure, you can select text in the graphical editor, and you, and, but you, have, you know, you, if you're going back and forth between selecting different kinds of stuff and selecting, um, uh, you know, tools on a menu palette and stuff, you're dead because you can't do it fast enough to keep up with the kind of performance that Fred had in mind. Okay, so, um, uh, Alan Kay often says, you know, in Kai, we always think about easy to use interfaces. So the easiest, you know, music box is a really easy to use interface for, um, is all you have to do is wind it up and then it plays music. Okay. A violin, on the other hand, is not an easy to use interface, right? The, so if you've ever, li if you live next to a person in the next apartment who's trying to learn the, 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 the violin, it's awful. Okay, so um, the violin is optimized for expressiveness and agility for people who are expert in it. And this is one of Fred's rigs here um, uh, that for stand up performance. When I saw him, so he built a lot of custom input devices that were necessary to run his stuff. And uh, I saw him, he had it all built into a, a chair, and I wished I had, uh, you know, just taken a photograph of him in the chair because that was also uh, something to see. But, um, uh, but it required some specialized input devices. Now we're going to go backstage and we're going to uh, see some of the um, what's behind this. Is there's an underlying tree structure which allows the performer to manipulate all his guys. It's like chords for a guitarist. And the more chords you know, the better you're able to improvise. And everybody has trees, so Slater can you? And the lyrics are just In order on it. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So, so you see that it, it imposes a structure on the, um, on the, um, uh, it supposes a, a tree structure on the graphics, which could be either done by hand or produced by a program. Okay. So once you have a tree structure, well, then you're in WISP territory. Okay. And then was all you need is a vowel. So he arranged it so everything in his graphic editor was able to be a vowel. Back to use plus. Kind of literally. Um, here's the function. There are the arguments. So if we pop that guy. Okay, so so you so you can see that plus here plus three and four can be evaluated. This is kind of like Lisp, but things like George can also be evaluated if you attach semantic meaning to the graphics. Well, how do you attach semantic meaning to the graphics? Okay, and that's where he came up with what I thought is a really brilliant idea, which is visual grammars for visual languages. And we're gonna go back to, uh, Scott showed you the visual uh, facilitation of uh, Sibtran, and Fred uh, um, had a, a side hustle, which he called visual tele-facilitation, which was playing the uh, visual annotator on a, tel on a remote meeting. And I wish he were here today to do this. But um, he deconstructed the, the, the language that David Sibbett was using for representing ideas on a, a brainstorming board. And then he let you use a visual grammar to uh, specify that. And then the key part of Viztopia was there was a visual parser, which parsed the visual grammar, compiled it into a program, and then you let you use that program for recognizing the graphics. So let's, so let's see how all that happened. David Sibbett doing group graphics. As part of his practice, he evolved this visual language that helps him organize text and graphics, which involves, among other things, uh, bullet lists, hollow arrows, straight arrows. So if we have a visual grammar to guide a parser, then we can define that grammar of grammars, and then we can compile the grammar which actually will be able to parse subtran expressions. So in order to do this, I have to show you that the trees that are underlying structure available now, this is all lumped together, whereas these guys are just lying around. They're atomic top-level guys, and hence that's where parsing comes in trying to use the spatial arrangement to deduce the underlying tree structure. So what you see, the little um, dash boxes, is the parser using the spatial structure of this particular grammar to crawl around this spatial arrangement of things, recognizing some of the elements of Sibtran, and then returning uh, That those same objects only now uh, in a tree structure as defined by the grammar. One of the questions people ask is, yes, but has something really been done? And so the answer to that is we have a form here called, was it really parsed? So we uh, evaluate that. And we get back a parse tree where we can see the whole thing is a Sibtran expression, which is a straight arrow pattern that involves a visual literal and then a text line, and then a hollow arrow pattern, and then finally a, a bullet list, bullet pad, hollow arrow pattern, and so on. 
Okay, so you could see how this meets the criteria that Scott laid out for visual languages, is that not only can you see the visual language, but the computer can see the visual language, okay? That the, the computer can see the spatial relations between objects that you put on the screen. And with a, with a spatial, with a visual parser, it can use those spatial relationships to provide procedural semantics for languages. So you could imagine, for example, teaching it uh, circuit symbols like in Rocky's boots, and then you could connect it to it, you have, make it do a circuit simulation. You could imagine being able to draw chemical formulas and then make it do reactions automatically, okay? And as a graphical performer, you could make your own visual language about how the shapes and forms go on the screen, and you could modify that in real time, okay? So that's the idea of what it means to be a visual language. And I think that, you know, Fred had that, that idea, and I think it's, it's a very much a, a, a important language for an idea to carry forward to the, today. So that's what I wanted to communicate with you. Um, David so, Sivet doing group well, graphics. Okay, so I'll just leave you with a few words from Ted, from uh, Fred here. Underlying structures that permit dancing also permit processing. So we have text graphic manipulation, which can either be by the human in performance or a program in processing. And one kind of pro performance is uh, group graphics, as we saw in this film. And uh, another is dance, as which was the opening demonstration. And then a dance move. <coughs> dance move that, um, that occurred to me later is kind of apropos, which is that we turn that thing kind of inside out and upside down and we lead with dance rather than processing and the rest kind of follows. Okay, so text graphic manipulation, that was Fred's central idea. So if I can't dance, I don't wanna be part of your revolution. So I think Fred's contribution to humanity was giving away from, for graphics to dance and for graphics to be part of the revolution. It's last call at VLI's Graphics Bar. I hope you enjoyed your evening. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna say a few words. Um, I'm gonna start by showing a t-shirt that Fred made and this t-shirt is an embedded, a visual language, it's an embedded syntax, and this is the definition of member, it's a Lisp program, and the definition for all of the keywords in the Lisp programming language that he designed for this is on the back. And it, Henry, it, it if you can stop the screen share, then we can actually see the t-shirt. Uh, I thought I just did. You did, but already oh, had sat down. Okay. Oh, uh, so no, no, I, just, I can stand up. Okay. So anyway, here's the t-shirt, and this is a definition for member, and it's the and of the or of a recursive de definition of 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 um of uh, y and the could or of x. And and uh, and the definition of the language is uh, visual elements are on my back. Uh, you you can I can I can uh, send around uh, a picture of this T-shirt. Uh, he made some of these T-shirts because he did not get his paper into Ichikai. He was a uh, um, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite, um, you know, creative at figuring out how to make uh, communication happen. I'm going to take really only uh, three minutes uh, now to to just say a few things. Uh, do you see my visual language uh, um, slide now? Yes. Okay, good. So um, <clears throat> basically. Um, the, the animation uh, of images was, was, uh, was demonstrated in Iran 5,000 years ago. Ivan Sutherland uh, had uh, this uh, incredible program, um, Sketchpad, uh, which he described in 1963. And you see them manipulating these cubes, uh, working with circuits. And of course, Dougal Engelbar, which we were talking about before, 
he um, has, there's a beautiful video you can find online of, of the NLS system where he is manipulating structures of knowledge and information with graphical um, techniques, very much in line with, with the stuff that, uh, that Fred did and it's worth, worth looking at. Of course, now visual language <laughs> has gotten to the point where it's overlay, I call this overlapping, uh, lay, um, um, which, 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 which of course mixed reality does. This is a beautiful uh, video you can find by Kiechi Mitsuda. And I say that visual language is the systematic use of presentation techniques to convey meaning. Um, I, um, I, I made a video which you can find uh, that, that goes through um, a, a definition and, 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 a, and a, de a demonstration of a, of a system that makes visual languages, teaches about visual languages, and lets you uh, parse visual languages called uh, VIEW. And you can find it at um, this, uh, at this my, my YouTube uh, channel. Um, it's VIEW is the name of it. And I would play some of it right now for you, but I don't think we really have, have time, except to say that, um, uh, whoops, uh, except to show you that, um, oh, well, I can't show that even, uh, to say that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that, that there are not very many different kinds of ways of describing things visually. There's positional, um, size, temporal, and rule, and there's only a few different kinds of positional, and you can find them a little more depth described in, in, my, in, in a couple papers I've written, also in this chapter of this book, um, about visual language. Uh, but visual language in some sense, um, if you think about computer graphics, computer graphics is the presentation layer. And so uh, every visual language has a presentation layer, um, uh, a visual uh, syntax, how things move around with each other, and then a semantics, what's the meaning of them, how they move around with each, with each, with each other. Which, which, with each other. And I don't really think that I have time to go go any more deeply into it. It's just that there is a field and a lot of people have worked in this area. And I think that this evening was, was a wonderful taste from my point of view of some of the contributions of, uh, of Fred and also the contributions of some very, very exciting people that, um, that Fred uh, also um, had in his life. Um, and so I want to leave, leave it with that. Um, and I don't know if there's time, if people can stay a few minutes there are people in the audience we know that knew Fred very well and were even part of these activities, Banya Montavo and, and, and others. And if people want to, we can, we, can, um, we can open it up a little bit at this point. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, I hope that this all makes a little bit of sense to you that uh, there is a future of making visual languages that will not try to do um, visual programming languages to date, have tried to put the IO language and the structure and the function and the flow all on the screen at the same time. At that point, you run out of space. And basically, I believe that visual programming environments of the future are going to have to use perspective. So you'll use your visual uh, real estate more, more judiciously. And Scott, if you ever want to talk about that, I'd be delighted to. So um, with that, um, Nancy, are there any questions or thoughts that you want to um, uh, air? I uh, no, I'm just interested in, in hearing from a couple of the people in the audience who I think are going to be able to uh, add to or give another remembrance. Fania, are you one? I, I'm going to allow you to talk. <laughs> yes, am I? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Now we can hear you, yes. Can I also use the video or? Uh, yes. Wait a minute, I'm going to see how we do that. And Fania, it's kind I'm of putting you. I, Make it short if you can. I'm gonna. I'm putting you in as a panelist, so that means now you should have uh, the option of showing your video. Do I need oh, to do something hey. special? There I am. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Can you, uh, yeah. I wanna. Uh, can we stop sharing the slides so we can see Fania all the way? Please. Thanks. Here we go. Okay, well, uh, how I met Fred. Um, I happened to have given a panel at SIGGRAPH one year. And so they put me on the program committee the next year. <laughs> and um, Fred submitted a paper and they put it in the out pile. And at the last minute, we're supposed to go through the out pile to see if there's anything good in there that we've missed. So I went through that 
and convince the committee that this was a good paper because Fred was talking about list and, and combining graphics with list. And that was one of my big hobby horses because I wanted to make visual interfaces just like list compositional, um, uh, very direct. You could grab properties, combine them. Anyway, that was my big deal. And um, so I, and I thought that SIGGRAPH could use something like this because it seemed like all the symbolic representation AI people were way over here and all the graphics people were way over here. And the graphics people could really use LISP to, to get something more semantics going on than just kind of surface surface things. Anyway, so, and that, then I went to hear his, his talk and we became friends. And then every time I saw him at Stanford, we'd run into each other. We have very good chats. So I was really sorry to hear him pass. Uh, he was a really good guy. Thank you, Fanya. Uh, is Dan still here? Dan Halbert, do you want to uh, speak up? Oops. I, th I thought I had you here. Maybe you live. I'm there here. He can you hear me? There you go. Okay, good. Yeah. We can hear you. Do you want to, you want me to sure, show you? Sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. You should be able to sh uh, turn your video on now, I think. Wait a minute. Do I have to promote you? It looks I think he's fine. Okay. Dan? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I also. I'm sorry. He. I just put him in as a panelist so he can show himself. Yeah. I, I, what I. What I just want to hear him most. You're muted, Dan. Unfortunately. Oh, there we go. Hey. All right. Hi. Hi. Hi, Henry. Henry told me just this. Just this today about this. I was really shocked to hear about Fred. But we we formed this small group, and I was kind of on the periphery of this. The summer that we were Alan Kay's like pets or whatever. Alan Kay was actually sick all summer and we never saw him, which was a kind of a strange experience that summer. But I have the same t-shirt that um, there we that, are. Uh, <laughs> that Ted showed, except in a different color. And I, Henry, I think you did a, a fantastic job of showing the magic of what Fred was thinking about and talking about which I have had no contact with after the early 80s, but clearly still came through even these many years later. And Thank hi, you. Fanya, I haven't seen you in ages also. You worked in the same research lab <laughs> a long time ago. Great to see you. <laughs> Who are we? No, uh, I, I just there... have, I just, I, I was, it was something about, the way Fred talked and I, I, you know, his voice came back to me and I just, he, he had such, he had such really amazingly different ideas and like just to come up with that t-shirt for instance was nobody had ever thought of representing Lisp that way and it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> so that's, that's all I have to say. It was so, just wonderful. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I, I think that- I can't hear um, you. I think that has become um, pretty late now. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm really sorry to keep everybody so late. It, we normally end earlier. I think that this has been a, a lovely way to, to get a bunch of people that I would love to have at Bay Kai more often to come. And we really appreciate you visiting. And we really appreciate the, all of the, 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 the statements you made. And um, it was really a lovely evening for me and uh, with that, I, I want to thank everybody and hope that we uh, um, look forward to looking on the Beikai, um, uh, uh, or org to see what the next programs coming up are. And we will, um, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you at future Beikai events. And please join if you can and uh, contribute as you can. Thank you very much for the evening. Thank you. I I was going to say uh, there's two events coming up in the next week that people may be interested in. So I'll just show, uh, wait a minute, I want to share my screen briefly if I can find that. Don't go away. Well, hold on one second. Well, I thought I was, I thought I was queued up, but I'm not. One second, we'll be queued up because I thought 
at least these two things would be of interest. Just speak them. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to read them. Uh, let's see if this shows up. It's still trying to come. OK, one, here we go. Uh, where it, I, Sorry, we're going to do it this way. This is the ugly way, but we can we know it works. OK. I think we're going to be there. So we've got two meetups of interest in the coming week and a half or so. One of them is it's going to tide you over until the November Bake Kai meeting. I think you should be able to see this one. Can you see it without yes. all the crud in the way? Yes. Come on. Here comes number one. Designing for gender inclusivity software is going to be featured tomorrow night at the Silicon Valley. Um, what's this called? Oh. Engineering Leadership Community, and there's a meetup, and you can see the, if you go to sv-elc slash events on meetup, you'll get to the right one. Okay, Margaret Burnett and Anita Sarma right. from Oregon State. And then the following week, a uh, longtime friend of Bay Kai, Dan Rosenberg, is going to be speaking about cognitive burden of software and how to address it in his talk, which is related to his new book, The Magic of Semantic interaction design. And again, another meetup sign up from the SF Bay ACM chapter. And then we'll see you on the week after the election next month in November with another fabulous program. So thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you for, for being patient through the whole process. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Good night. <laughs>